I'm going to be talking about the Get Bonus Infinite Entertainment System. Get Bonus! So the Get Bonus Infinite Entertainment System is a graphics, is a video game console implemented in Racket. I'm going to be talking about three different things about it. I'm talking about the graphics, the architecture, and the design of the games. Let me go through this very fast. So, the Get Bonus Picture Processing Unit is the name for the graphics engine. It is based on the Super Nintendo, which is the best graphics, which is the best game console ever made. Now, like, uh, like, uh, actually, I misspoke before. Call of Duty runs at 60 frames per second, but Battlefield and Halo they run at 30. So, like Halo, I sorry, like Call of Duty, it runs at 60 frames per second all the time, no matter what. That means that you have 16.6 milliseconds to generate a frame do all your logic and spit it out. So I have to focus on how to do this quickly. Now I'm primarily interested in purely functional programming in this tight operating environment. I'm not super interested in amazing graphics, so I focus on mimicking what the Super Nintendo provides. The Super Nintendo gives you 256 by 224 uh, pixels. I'd make that slightly bigger to make a widescreen Super Nintendo. And one thing that's kind of annoying about the widescreen Super Nintendo is that there's an odd number on one column. So I just make it just a little bit bigger to make it even to make so that the maths work out nicely. Now, the Super Nintendo could display 128 sprites, like we got Mega Man right here. And so we're focused on doing that. Now, <clears throat> the Super Nintendo had very tight constraints for how many sprites it could show and what could happen to them. It would let you move them to the left and right, move them up and down. It would let you magnify in the x direction and magnify in the y direction. And it would let you rotate. But it could only do all of these things for some small set of them. The Get Bonus graphics engine lets you do them for as many sprites as you want. In addition, though, the Get Bonus system doesn't display bitmap graphics. Instead, it displays graphics that are palleted, like the Super Nintendo did. Which means that uh, there is a palette that corresponds to this layout of Mega Man. And if I change that palette to like palette number 17, it switches to Heat Man. So these graphics are these palleted things. In addition to that, we do allow you to perform a uniform tint, which is nice for adding opacity. But also, like the Super Nintendo, there is a finite set of sprites that we have available before the program starts. So Mega Man is like sprite number 17. And if we change this to sprite 24, that turns out to be Link. So this is part of the sprite data. Now, when we're displaying one of these sprites, you might think that Link right here is a rectangle that is defined by the four vertices. But actually, because we're displaying with OpenGL, we have to break them up into two different triangles, the upper triangle and the lower triangle. So for a total of six vertices that we're going to have to pipe out to the graphics card. Here's some first code. What we do is we define a low-level C data structure that corresponds precisely to the memory that's going to go out to the graphics card. Every one of these is 40 bytes big. And so we're going to have six of them per sprite, so we're going to have 240 bytes. Now, <clears throat> we can use Racket's FFI to get a pointer to the memory of the graphics card, which we do right here. So now I've got a pointer to the memory of the graphics card. Figuring out which flags to ask the graphics card for was incredibly painful to figure out what they are. But those are the best flags, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we have all these flags, Get Bonus is designed to simulate the hardware of the Super Nintendo. So it makes a single OpenGL drawing call per frame. Most modern games will draw, will make uh, maybe 100 or 200 calls. So we are incredibly tight and we can do all our drawing inside of a single uh, interaction with OpenGL. That goes to this shader right here, which is written in C. This is the entire shader. There is nothing left out. I have not deleted anything. This right here implements the transformation of um, moving the sprite on the screen. And that gets sent to this shader, which implements the palleted drawing. So what you're looking at right here is the entire graphics engine, except for a few defines that say, this is the name of this function. Now, that thing right there, <laughs> it does use three pieces of static data. It uses a database of sprites to say that link is number 17. And associated with every sprite is where it exists on a giant atlas of all the pictures, along with its width and height. That atlas, called a sprite atlas, I use a bin packing algorithm to lay them out efficiently on a rectangle. And that actually stores the data. Now this data, the color data, is stored in 4-bit palettes which use an index to go look at what the actual 32-bit color is. So altogether, we have about 11 kilobytes of data that we're sending to the graphics card for the whole game engine to run. 
Now, graphics cards are designed for having like four gigabytes of data, and we use 11 kilobytes. So we're not, we're just barely scratching the surface. So altogether, we can display two million sprites at 60 frames per second. That corresponds to 16 per pixel. <laughs> um, in contrast to the Super Nintendo's 32 per line. So let me just show you it real fast. <clears throat> All right. So that's all I'm going to show you about the graphics, because the real thing that's interesting is the architecture of the games. So the architecture of the games is based on similar ideas to the How to Design Programs Big Bang. In Big Bang, you write a purely functional description of your, of your game state called the world, and you write a few functions. You write one that, um, that represents how the world evolves over time, one to draw the world, and want to make the world react to input. Now, this is very interesting, but I find it very hard to build large, scalable games this way, primarily for two reasons. The first is that you have lots of plumbing, because if you have multiple instances of the same kinds of things, for instance, you have a player and two enemies, then you have to have lots of little transition functions that correspond to every piece of that. And you have to come up with protocols for how they interact with each other, which is incredibly, which is inherently sequential, which is very hard to reason about. The other problem is, is that um, this style of programming impose, takes away your program's ability to have control information inside of it. If you were writing a normal straight line program, you might write you know, a loop for the player and a loop for the enemy, and they might contain an if statement that changes what their behavior is going to be. That's not possible with the world style of programming. You have to take that control data and turn it into a data structure which is called the inversion of control, which is the enemy of web programmers and other things like that. And one of the mantras that the web server that's part of Racket, which I also work on, is designed to stop. So I take a similar idea to the continuation-based web server in my games. By providing a process-based uh, representation of games. So what we do is we have a Big Bang operating system. And the Big Bang operating system has multiple threads that it runs. And these are not real threads of the OS, and they're not real threads of Racket either. They're simulated threads uh, implemented using delimited continuations. And we have a very small set of system calls. We can make new threads, we can write information to the environment, such as writing graphics, and we can read information from the environment, such as the controller. And there's two interesting things about this. When we write, the engine forces us to block until the next frame is being generated which prevents us from cross-talking between processes. Because once you write, you can't influence another process until the next frame. So this imposes a function, uh, a, a purely functional perspective. In addition, when we read, we read sets, so we can't observe the ordering. So this is an example of code where we might start three threads for the player, the enemy, and another enemy. And there would be a loop for the player that would you know, read the state of the controller, look at where a bullet was on screen, and then write some graphics, and maybe write some sound too, some beep boops, which you heard. This right here is the entire source code for the paddle in a Pong game. There is no source code that I'm leaving out, and, I'm, and it, all it does is it calls things to read uh, the state of the controller and move things around. So this model is incredibly flexible um, based on this idea of the blocking of write and reading of sets. So it corresponds to the MapReduce architecture, actually, because every process is totally independent from every other one, and the effects that they have on the environment combine together by a reduction process. And it also corresponds to the entity component system uh, model, which is very popular in games right now. Let me show you the entire source code of the operating system. So here is the entire source code of a system call. Um, how, and it uses delimited continuations to grab the state of the process, remember where it was, and then send that to the OS along with a request of what we all, actually want to happen. That's the entire way to do a system call. This is the entire internal loop of the operating system where it runs a process until it stops making system calls. Yes, Robbie? Oh, so we, yeah, I'm, still, I'm still processing the previous part. Uh, when, when you're designing a game and you're uh, writing the logic of the player, yep. you said blocks until writes, so the idea is you just run all the threads until everybody does a write, and then that's, that's a frame. Right, and that's going to compute the next frame, basically, and then you can use the continuations to pick up from that point. Yep. 
So this runs the entire running all processes until they get to a frame. And now this is the source code. I had to shrink the font a little bit for all the system calls. It implements write, read, etc. And so that right there in those three slides, it's about 80 lines of code, is the entire actual architecture of the engine. That hooks up with the other 50 lines that I showed you of the graphics. And then bam, that's basically everything that makes my games. But there's one more thing that I want to tell you about, which is the game design ideas that are part of Get Bonus. Yes. Sorry, can you go back to the uh, the, the read the read producing a uh, set? set? So I read produces a set. That. So um, if four enemies write something down, then you would know what order they did those things if read returned a list. By returning a set, you can't know. Therefore, your game will never behave differently if I schedule them differently. Therefore, having a set makes it so that it is functional. You can only observe a set through associative folding operators under like a list, which you can observe with non-associative folding operators. Thank you. So to me, a game is represented by this function called play, where you put your skill in and it gives you back a score. A score, and this function has got to be deterministic, because I don't want my skill to be based on your stupid randomness, OK? So it's got to be a deterministic function. Now, the score could be like a bool if I win, or it could be something between 0 and 1, representing how good I did, or like how close I got to the end, or maybe like a, a real number, which is just a score that I could get. Or it could be a combination of all these things. Now, clearly, games like Pac-Man fit this, and games like Cannibal, where I'm trying to get really far, or games like Asteroids, where I'm trying to get a high score. Any game that you're thinking of that you like, that doesn't fit that mold, I probably don't like that game and don't care about it. Or I only like a small piece of that game. So for instance, I really like Final Fantasy, but I only like the battles. So the, a single battle is a play experience for me in a Final Fantasy game. So that's what I'm inter interested in doing. Now what a game is, is it's a function that takes levels and produces these play experiences. Now get bonus implies, makes you do something very particular with levels. It makes you put all your levels in bijection with the natural numbers. <laughs> this is not procedural generation, which is currently very vogue right now in game design. Instead, it makes you actually map every single natural number to some level. And I provide a language for actually mapping any data structure, plus a lot of invariance about those data structures, which Robbie and I worked on. Uh, into the natural numbers, which we use as part of randomly checking your Redux programs. It can enumer enumerate your Redux programs because it can enumerate <coughs> uh, uh, data structures. And so your levels are represented data structures, so we put them in bijection with the naturals. So for instance, you know, level 81 right there uh, is you know, world, I think, 2-3 of Super Mario Brothers 1. And what this means is that you have a truly infinite amount of play experiences. Unlike these boring procedurally generated games, which only have a mere 2 to the 32 minus 1 different random seed states. Yes? Uh, I've, I've thought a little bit about transfinite numbers, but uh, you know, I'm focusing right now on just Aleph Null. A left not. <laughs> now, sometimes though, a lot of the levels that map to like 73 aren't fun. So it's also useful for games to come with generation functions that can produce levels. So for instance, we might say, I want an underwater level that's easy. That'll give us level 81, which corresponds to that one that I mentioned before, Mario 2-3, which is the first underwater level in Super Mario 1. I'll bet you all knew that, right? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> now, games are also part I want to make incredibly beautiful source code. So I don't want to make Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man. I want to generalize both of those into a single function that I'm going to call the Pac-Man series, where I can give in descriptions of variants and produce different games. So for instance, with like Final Fantasy, like Final Fantasy 1 and Final Fantasy on the PSP with different graphics, they're clearly the same game. But I also consider like Final Fantasy 7 and 13 to also be the same game, just with tweaks to the battle engine. So I'm very interested in exploring this idea to the maximum <laughs> with my uh, functions. Now, in summary, a get bonus game is these set of four functions, which you implement as a get bonus author. Now, one of the coolest things that I do is, is that these scores and these levels, they don't just exist in a vacuum. Get bonus keeps a giant database of every play experience you've ever had. And every time you finish a play experience, it asks you, did you like this level? Do you want to share this level with other people so that you can tell them about this level that you discovered? You discovered that 67 is a really great Mario game. 
And so once you discover that, you can share with other people, and you can be asked, do you want to improve your score on this in the future? Because it knows what your score is, so it can show you how to like integrate that to be an even better score than you had before. So it has this giant database, and you can sit down to get bonus and say, I want to play for 20 minutes. Give me my schedule. And it will tell you, OK, you're going to play this game, then this game, then this game. And it actually runs that experience for you. So when you start get bonus, you can pick a particular level to play if you want. Or you can just say, play, and it'll just keep going until, and every time you fail, it'll immediately go back to another one. One of the things I hate most about games is when you have to hit play again or retry. I want it to just go instantaneously. So that's what GetBonus does. So in summary, the GetBonus Infinite Entertainment System combines all sorts of cool things about Racket. It combines unsafe C interoperability with OpenGL and GPU shaders, which are written in some really beautiful Racket macros. It combines crazy stuff like delimited continuations to simulate an operating system to produce a map reduced based game architecture. And it combines that with efficient Godel bijections for mapping levels to the natural numbers and doing all sorts of crazy stuff like that. And in summary, this is what Racket is. Being able to do all these crazy things at the low level, all these crazy things at the middle, and get big ideas too. And if you remember one thing, now you're playing with Racket. Uh, Jay, how do we get you some hardware for this? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so that would be cool. Um, one of our goals as the Racket implementers is we really want to be on portable devices like this. Uh, it's very painful to do that right now. So something that I'm personally interested in is getting Get Bonus to run on my phone. The one thing, though, is that, as you may have noticed, I like buttons. And there's no buttons here, so that's not really fun. Uh, but if there were buttons, I would be spending all my, all my sleeping hours working on getting Get Bonus running on something like the iPhone. But yes, I think that'd be great. Yes? Can you show us the music code? Ah, yes. Yeah, so the music code. Um, <laughs> So I have a experimental simulator of the NES APU to generate exactly the NES sounds. Uh, but it's not production quality yet. It's a little bit too inefficient. So right now, I kind of punt and use WAV files. Uh, but I do something kind of cool, which is, is that um, I use OpenGL for 2D position sound. So basically, what I can do is you can attach a sound to a particular element on the screen. And it will run a mixer to make it so that it changes as you go. So for instance, if I load the Pong game, then you'll hear it bounce on the left side of the screen versus the right side of the screen um, when it bounces. So if you listen closely, that kind of came from the right side of the screen, and this will kind of come from the left side of the screen. And that is, that is not a hack at all. What you do is inside, when you, um, what you do when you attach a sound like when you create a sound, you can say this sound will be at this x, y coordinate. And you don't just give a coordinate. You give a higher order function, which will look up in the state where that is at any instant of time. By the way, as you know, I'm not sure if you noticed, but this runs at an incredibly high frame rate. I never drop a single frame ever. Um, and so I have all sorts of interesting tweaks for making sure that I generate like no garbage. And even though I'm using delimited continuations and high order functions all over the place, it's actually the architecture of the engine that makes it so fast. So for instance, um, the way that those system calls work out, I can guarantee that I only need two hash tables ever, because I can sort of do a double buffering thing where I swap them back and forth. So I can have very stable memory usage, even in Racket. Have you tried it on a Raspberry Pi, and do you hit 60 frames per second? Um, I'm, not wor I'm not super worried about hitting, frame, hitting that on a Raspberry Pi, even though I haven't used it, because basically all the hard work is in the graphics engine, which is on the card. And actually, the Raspberry Pi has a very good implementation of OpenGL, yes. And I fit with an incredibly constrained usage of OpenGL. I actually can work on um, like the lowest end OpenGL devices. Like This laptop isn't even very good, uh, and you know, it's great. So I'm not super worried, but I haven't actually tried it. Like if I monitor the performance of the card, it says that I'm not using any resources. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, in the racket side, I don't hit a very high CPU usage either. Yeah, so who knows? I would like to thank you for using the limited control 
to implement an operating system because that's where it came from in 1984 when Dan made me implement many operating systems in 14 weeks. And Dan Friedman, I hope you saw that he used the limited control and that you will never ever use the stupid <laughs> calls you see again. <laughs> I was reviewing a paper for uh, Popple and uh, they were talking about delimited control and I was like, I wish that they would just write a, a, an example. I know that they're super useful, but this stupid author can't even say anything about why they're useful. It was very frustrating. I didn't miss it. Don't tell any Popple people that. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Chris had a question. Uh, it's more of a comment on your thing about liking to have it's more of a comment about um, saying you like buttons on mobile devices, and I'm like, you should, you can surely get like a Bluetooth controller. It doesn't fit in your pocket then. Yeah. Although I'm very interested in the Razer Jungle Cat. It's not out yet though. Can we see you play more of those games? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really like the Pac-Man game. Yeah, the cat's nice. Now, something that's very cool about this is, is that this is a version of Pac-Man that it looks random, but it's not. It's actually, as I mentioned before, all the levels are in bijection. And the game is designed to be infinitely long, so that as you clear screens, it will actually generate um, another quadrant, kind of like a Pac-Man Championship Edition DX. Um, so that you can uh, continue playing. So let me just clear one screen. So let's get that last one over there. Okay, see that, that key over there appeared in the upper right hand quadrant? Uh, when I go touch that key, it's going to switch that quadrant down there so I can keep going. So the game is infinitely long. Uh, and what I actually do to generate uh, infinite series of natural numbers is I take um, linear combinations of pi and e. Um, because the nice thing about that is that linear combinations of those two things uh, produce infinite sequences of digits, because pi has infinite digits. Uh, and so since pi has infinite digits, if you look at pi, you can sort of view it as an infinite sequence. And linear combinations of those will be unpredictable, things that are like pi, transcendental numbers. And so basically what I do is every uh, quadrant is a truncation of a piece of pi, and once you finish that one, you go on to the next piece of pi. Uh, and we make it so it's unpredictable by these linear combinations.